wish for you. I could not think of anything greater than to wish that you would now experience the story of Paul. I do not know if you ever asked yourself, who is Paul? See, Paul is not mentioned in any non-biblical work of the first century outside of the Bible. And yet, he wrote so many letters, seemingly from jail. And they will be recorded. Yet there is no record of any Paul being in the jail. And certainly, he would be recorded. So who is Paul? Paul is that last state of consciousness that man must reach if he would experience the reality of God. You and I have ambitions in the world and want to be dictators, doctors, lawyers, scientists. All these are in order. But there will come a time in the life of man when there will be a hunger Saint upon him, as told us in the book of Amos, it will not be a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the words of God. And only an experience of God can satisfy this hunger. That is that state of consciousness called Paul. Only an experience of God can satisfy it. Not a thing in the world could satisfy it. If I wish this night that you would have the experience of Paul, I am wishing for you that you would have the experience of God. That final hunger would be satisfied within you that you would actually know from experience of the reality of God. At the very end of the book of Luke, when they tell the story of his end, they said that he expounded the matter to them from morning to evening, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some believed from what they heard, while others disbelieved. That is the story. Some believed it, others disbelieved it. You will find this in every walk of life. Now Paul is the one who started the movement, as it were. He found God's plan of salvation. And he called it a mystery. Paul uses the word mystery no less than 20 times. He tells us it is a mystery. He speaks of it as a pattern, a pattern of words. When he writes his letter to Timothy, he said, follow the pattern of the sung word which you have heard from me. God the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. He tells us in his letter to the Galatians, having spoken to the Galatians and explained the mystery of Christ. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the truth of the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish having begun with the Spirit? Are you now ending with the flesh? Paul saw that the Godhead was veiled in flesh and blood. And so he could say, when it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. 
the outer rational mind does not understand revealed truth. For revealed truth cannot be logically proven. So the hook turn and ask them to throw light on my experience if my experience is not within the framework of the rational mind. If I tell you what I experience and it's not a thing that you can do about it on this level, then how would I turn to you or anyone in the world and ask for some light upon the experience? So having had the experience that only an experience of God could satisfy, he couldn't go to the rational mind, which he called flesh and blood. Now when he uses the word Christ, remember the word Christ means Messiah. In the Old Testament the word Christ is not used, but the word Messiah is. And so Messiah was the promise. Now we said, henceforth I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded, now we use the word Christ, use the word now Messiah. Even though I once regarded the Messiah from a human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. Having had the experience, he is not looking for any flesh and blood Savior called Messiah. He experienced Messiah. But it pleased God to reveal his son in me. I conferred not the flesh and blood. Now he said, I have been crucified with Christ. Which means Messiah. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now you put it all together and I'll try to unfold a certain pattern for you. Jesus is the pattern man. That pattern is hidden in man as he asked the question in his letter to the Corinthians. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless of course you fail to meet the test. I hope you realize that we have not failed in meeting the test. Now I'll give you a quick test. Jesus Christ. Now what did you at that moment think? Something on the outside? Let me repeat it. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Now Jesus Christ, now what does the mind do? Go on the outside to some existence, something external to himself, then you fail to meet the test. For Jesus Christ is in you. Now that pattern has to unfold within you. It can unfold within you as long as you have a concept of Jesus Christ as flesh and blood. Even this morning's paper, I could hardly believe my eyes. Here is a new paper from the Vatican, giving new guidelines, but insisting on the tradition that it must be kept. And the tradition that they mention is that the virginity of Mary must be sustained. Well, if you read the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, I don't see how anyone with a brain in his head could sustain that story if you take it as secular history. If you aren't familiar with the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, let me quote it for you. Is this not Jesus, the carpenter, the brother of James and Jose and Simon and Judas and are not his sisters, it's plural, with us even to this day. So they mention six members of his family, four brothers, and at least two sisters. And himself would be the seventh. And now I must look upon this as secular history and say that the mother of the brood remains the virgin, but they omit the six that are mentioned and say she only had one. 
then justify it by saying Joseph had these others from some other woman it's not mentioned in scripture at all now I'm called upon by today's direction to admit that the Pope is infallible well now that's the height but the height of nonsense but the complete silly nonsense I don't care what you have as a background in religion that statement is stupid religion has other things true religion has a thing to do with secular history it is salvation history the whole thing unfolds in you it's all about you it takes place within your own wonderful skull that's where it takes place the being spoken of as the Lord in the Bible is your own wonderful I am. That's God. Your own wonderful human imagination, that is the Lord. One day when you get rid of some physical Christ, some physical being external to yourself, you make room for the stirring of the pattern within you and the pattern unfolds within you. Paul said, I refuse to admit anyone but Jesus Christ and him crucified. You hear the word crucified and you think of some cruel act, don't you? It isn't. Let me share with you my experience of the crucifixion. It is sheer bliss. The 42nd chapter of Psalm, or the 42nd Psalm, if you prefer it. It tells the story of remembrance, and these things I remember. And now he recites what he remembers. How he went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God. It was a gay and happy crowd. That night, I led them in procession to the house of God. There were, all together, I would say, thrilled beyond measure because we are leaving, or leading to the house of God. A voice rang out as I led them. And the voice said, and God walked with them. A woman at my side, to my right, she answered the voice, and she said, If God walks with us, where is he? And the voice replied, At your side. She turned to her left, looking to my face, and then she said, What is Neville God? And the voice replied, Yes in the act of waking. Then the voice says to me and to me only, it came from the very depths of my being, I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamt a dream. I dreamed and I knew exactly what he was dreaming. He was dreaming that his eyes I also knew that when he woke from his dream, I am he. The two would cease to be two and they would become one. He is dreaming my life until he awakes within me. But when he awakes within me, he is not another. He awakes as the being in whom he fell asleep, whose life he is dreaming. That I did know. And then this happened. I felt myself move quickly from this wonderful crowd moving towards the seeming house of God. And then suddenly I am nailed upon this body with these six vortices. My head is a vortex. My two hands are vortices. My right side is a vortex. And my two feet, the soles of my feet, are vortices. And I tell you, it is sheer ecstasy. That's the crucifixion. 
That's when God crucified himself upon this cross called man of flesh and blood. For no one can attain to bliss unless he is generated here on earth. So you and I are here. And God deliberately laid himself down within us to dream our lives. And he is dreaming that he is you. And one day he will awake and he is you. And you are God. Without loss of identity. I will know you just as I know you now, but only you will be raised to the nth degree of beauty. And, well, I can't quite use words to describe the majesty and the dignity and all that is wonderful concerning you. And yet I will know you as God. I will know you as Jim, that I know and love as a friend, and I will still know Jimmy is God. That is the destiny for everyone in this world. So you can forget the historicity of scripture as organized churches keep it alive and maintained. So Paul made a statement in his famous 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians called the hymn in praise of love, the hymn of love. He said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. When you mature, spiritually, you give up these childish ways that insist on the historicity of Jesus and sexual history of the Bible. It is not. Christ is the pattern man buried in every child born of woman. And that pattern will unfold when that child becomes a man. So he stops accepting the flesh and blood Jesus and sees him for what he is. It's a pattern that unfolds within a man as the man in whom it unfolds. And it begins with the resurrection. The crucifixion is over for all of us. Everyone has been crucified with Christ on these garments called the cross. The day will come, I will start with the resurrection. You will rise within yourself, followed instantly by your birth from above. For no man can enter that state called the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. So he spent his day from morning to evening testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. And then he used for his argument the law of Moses, reading scriptures for them, and then the prophets and the Psalms, trying to show these passages parallel his own experience. What passage would parallel his experience when it pleased God to reveal his son in me? And the preposition is in, it's not to me, as some translators give it. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, that's where he's revealed. Suddenly within you, the Son appears. And the Son is just as told you in Scripture. The second song. And I will tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said unto me, Thou art my Son. Today I have begotten thee. Whose words are these? These are the words of the psalmist, David. So when he reveals his son in you, which is called Messiah, it is David. Then you know who you are, because he is telling of the decree of the Lord. God said unto David, Thou art my son. Well, if David now stands before you and calls you father, who are you? Are you not God? Are you not the Lord? Well, I prophesy for you, you will have it. You will have that experience where David stands before you and calls you Father. And then, and then only, you will know that you are the Lord God. All these things are going to happen in every child born of woman. When? How do I know when? Let me share with you an experience I do not think the lady is here tonight. She's been coming here recently and she wrote me a letter. And she said, I did not understand your book. There was 
given to me by a lady who recently brought me with her to your meeting. I've only been coming to your meeting recently, and I will come, I think, until the end. Well, they are not here tonight. But I will tell her story. He said, night before last, and her letter is dated the 11th of June. So this is the 9th of June. He said, in my dream, I found myself standing on the corner waiting for a streetcar or a bus. And they came by, and the crowds got on, and I let everyone go by. I wondered to myself if across the way, coming from the apartment house, someone is seen standing here, they will wonder what's wrong with that woman. She could have boarded one of these buckets to take us to her destination. And here I am waiting. Then a woman came to me and said to me, the train you're waiting for will be here in a minute. It's a black train, a long, flat black train, with seats on both sides, facing the street. I looked up and here is a long black train coming. Seats on both sides facing the street. I boarded it. Up front, I saw a crowd around the coffin. The coffin was covered and they were weeping. And my attention was drawn to the coffin. Then it was diverted because I looked to the street and here was a young woman, dead, very dead. So the right arm was eaten away up to the shoulder. And she was gay and really very gay, as she said. Then I noticed the feet began to move, and this woman began to be, I would say, restored to life, this young woman. Then my attention was turned now to the coffin, and out of the coffin rises a man clothed in white. At that moment I woke. I remained awake long enough to record it and to impress my mind with the dream. Fell back to sleep, and here I am among a huge crowd, and we're all going to hear Neville. Well, there's a feeling in the atmosphere that Neville is about to die. And we hasten our pace, so we want to be with him. He's about to die. So Neville puts a robe upon him, and he lays down in a ditch. And then he crawls through a small tunnel. But it seems so easy for him to do it. He crawls through the tunnel, which led into a cave. And when he entered the cave, he stretched himself out in the cave. And all of us are struggling to follow the same pattern. So we too crawled through this tube, and it was a very great struggle on our part. Not as easy as you made it. It seemed so effortless when you did it. Then you rose from the cave as though you had to change your mind and came back out the same way with the same effortlessness. You came out, we made the same effort. Again, I wondered whoever made this to you, why could not have made it easier? And so we all came out. But not everyone could make it. Many of us did, but not all could make it. I will tell you, all will make it, but all are not ready to make it. That was an adumbration. That was a foreshadowing of what is in store for everyone in this world. This is the mystery of life through death, unless a seed or the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die. It remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. So God died, literally died. God became as I am, that I may be as he is. He can't pretend that he is Neville. He has to actually become me. And therefore, in becoming me, he died. Buried in my skull. That's where he's buried. And the day will come, I will awaken, as I have awakened in my skull, and came out through that tube, that very small opening, and pushed my way out to discover the entire drama unfolding before me. So I say to you, you are immortal. You know why? Because you're God. God actually became 
as you are. And it cannot fail. So if today it is said of Paul, he tried to convince them about Jesus. And some believe from what he says, while others disbelieve. Those who disbelieve are only disbelieving for a while. They're still children. They can't get out of their minds the historicity of Scripture. They must hold on like a child to some little thing that they can put their hands upon it and touch it and see a physical Jesus on the outside. The day will come, man will be robbed of the historicity of Scripture. Then the pattern can stir within him and the pattern will unfold itself within that man. And everything said of Jesus in Scripture, he is going to experience in the first person singular present tense experience. Then he will know who Jesus is. For the whole pattern will unfold within him. He will tell it to the best of his ability. I thought I told it clearly in my book. Evidently, to this lady, I didn't. So she said, the books were given to me, and I read them, but I did not get them. Having attended a few of your lectures only recently, I now begin to understand the book, but not until I heard you speak from the platform. Well, that was quite a shock, because I thought the books were simply written, and I still do. I couldn't quite see how she could not grasp it. But by her own confession, she could not grasp it until she heard me. So here I am telling it from the platform and trying to tell it also in the book. And some believe it and some disbelieve it. Some will think this whole thing is simply sacrilegious. But I am trying to take from them their God. I am trying to take from them their false God. God that does not exist. I am trying to take that God from them. That the real God can begin to stir within them and unfold in them as them. Because until the false God disappears, the real God cannot awake within them. And as long as you have a Christ Jesus of flesh and blood, you do not know Christ Jesus. So listen to the words again. Henceforth, I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded Christ, from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. These are the words of Paul. I am crucified with Christ, said he. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm telling you, your real being is Jesus, that's the Lord. Your real son is David, that's the Messiah. But you do not know that you are the Lord and cannot know it until your son appears. The day will come, he will appear. And the minute he appears, you will know exactly who he is. There will be no uncertainty as, as to this relationship between you, the Father, and David, the Son. It takes the Son to reveal the Father. Now, no church in this land that I know of is teaching this, so I've been sent to tell it to you. And you are here, a small audience, but what does it matter? A small audience started on the truth, conveyed to the whole vast world. And I am telling you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. You are the Lord, suffering from amnesia, because you have forgotten who you are. That's how complete your gift was when you became man. And the day will come you will awaken and remember who you are, and because you are God the Father, there must be a son to bear witness to your fatherhood. And that son is David. And you will know who you are. Then one by one, we will re reunite into the one being who is God the Father. Without loss of our individuality. Without loss of our being that we are. I will know you in eternity. But know you as God. 
Now, here we only have two lectures left, and I thought these would be in order, even though they seem repetitious. They can't be repeated too often. Men so quickly forget. You go away for a month, and those you thought really understood you, when you return, they try to tell you, I just found the most wonderful book on diet. What a wonderful book on how to get into heaven in another way. A friend of mine, I thought he understood it. I thought he did. For he made extravagant pain. And in the last month he sent me books by men that I knew before they died here. We mustn't judge from appearances, I know. As I told him over the phone when I sent the books back, I had the dubious pleasure of knowing these men. The book that you just sent me, that man is incapable of uh, writing a decent sentence. I knew him when he sold stocks that did not exist. And there is no transforming power in death. He is still selling stocks that do not exist. And you asked me to read this book, I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him, and I'm not a strong man today, and he weighed when he died over 200 pounds. So you could see how far I would trust him. And I thought that man really understood what I'm talking about. I believe that he did. But that's how deceived you can be. When you think that they understand you, and they go away for a short while, maybe a year, and then they completely forget the message. You can tell them over and over that your own wonderful human imagination is God, and there is no other God, and don't start looking for another God. And that God is forever. His name is I am forever and forever. You can't leave it alone. That's the Lord. But he is a father, and I tell you from experience, the son is David. I saw he understood it. Because he told me one day that he had an experience, but I know it was an adumbration. It was a foreshadowing. He's a very powerful thinker. And so he could conjure and give himself a grand hallucination. And thought that was it. It wasn't it. That was an hallucination. When he thought, because he doesn't come that way. The dove does not come the way that he told me it came to him. It doesn't come that way. The whole heavens become translucent when he comes. And the dove floats. Just as though it's floating on water. But it's translucent. But the action of the dove is without effort. Therefore it must be floating. Then it descends gently upon you. And you like the ark. You like Noah. You stretch out your hand for it. And the dove lights upon your hand just as you're told in the book of Genesis. And you bring the dove to you. And then the dove smothers you for kisses. But the other is a wonderful adumbration. It's a wonderful forecasting. But then I thought that would be encouraging to him to have the adumbration and sustain him until the reality takes place. Evidently not. That's why I have to repeat it over and over and over. That you won't forget. So when he wrote his last letter to Timothy, but Timothy was then a man of God. He was no longer a child. For he is called a man of God. Only two are called man of God in scripture. One is Moses and one is Timothy. And so he speaks to the man of God. But he still has to remind them to follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me. God the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard it. Don't let anything come in and take from you that truth. For there's only one true way to God. Only one living and true way to the Father. And it's that pattern. And the pattern unfolds within you. And that pattern is called in Scripture, Jesus Christ. Or the Lord and His 
Christ. That's what it's called. And when it unfolds within you, you are the Lord. And you have a Messiah. He stands before you and he is David. Now I could close my eyes this very moment in confidence that everyone is going to experience it. I only hope you will not be diverted in the interval. I hope that you will actually believe what I've told you, that I know you're going to have it. And it's not anything that you saw in this morning's paper if you read what I read. I am Mary, and you can say that too, I am Mary. And birth to God must be, if I in blessedness for now and evermore would live. There is no other Mary. That holy womb is my own skull. That's the cave that this lady saw. And you go into that cave deliberately, voluntarily, and you die. In your dream that you are other than who you are because you are God, dreaming that you are John that you are Neville, that you are Stanley, that you are Jan. You are dreaming these. And when your dream is over, you are. You individualize yourself as Jimmy, as Stanley, as everyone in the world. And only God then awakes. And when God awakes, we are individualized and we are God. So the true temple of God is the individuality of man made perfect by the Holy Spirit within us. He comes within us and we are made perfect. And we then, the individualized man, is the true temple of God. And so I will meet you, yes, meet you in eternity. And you will know me. A lady is here tonight. She wrote me a letter this past week. The Neville, I was sitting in my living room. My husband had a toothache, and he retired. And I thought, well, I would just sit and meditate. I was meditating in my living room, and suddenly I felt the presence of God. I looked up, and there in my dining room, there you were. And I knew you were never, but I also knew you were God. There was no uncertainty in my mind. I'm looking at you. This is the devil that I know. Yet I know you're God. And you are clothed in light. Golden light. And then, I must tell you, he said in the very last, you are altogether beautiful. Well, thank you, my dear. I do know that when you see the being that you really are, no human words can describe the beauty. No human words can describe the majesty that is yours, the strength that is yours, the character that is yours. And through these mortal eyes, you can look into any mirror and you could never think that eternity is long enough to bring you to that state. And yet when it takes place, instantaneously you are that thing. So she saw it, as many have seen it, and many will see it until I depart this world, and then many will see it after I depart this world, for I know what I'm talking about. The whole story, as told in the scriptures, unfolded itself in me. And I am relating my own experience. I am not speculating, I am not theorizing, I am telling you exactly what happened to me. And if this lady witnessed what I have told you that I am, all well and good. You are told in scripture. He appeared first to Peter. Like this. He isn't called Peter here. Then to the twelve. I did. Then to five hundred. I had not heard from five hundred. But I am hearing from them. Then to James. Then to the apostles. And last as to one untimely born, he appeared also to Paul. For that is the last stage when that one comes, instantly it's going to unfold in him. But in her case, who sits here tonight, she has qualified for the highest office. For you are told in the ninth chapter, 
of First Corinthians when they questioned him concerning his apostleship. Said, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? He placed it as an indispensable prerequisite for apostleship to have seen the risen Lord. For he confessed he never saw any Jesus after the flesh. Never saw any Jesus after the flesh, nor will he ever, he said. Henceforth, I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. So he saw him, but not after the flesh. So this thing talking to you here is simply a veil. The Godhead is veiled in flesh and blood. And you see the flesh. The lady saw that which is veiled. And that's what I'm talking about. Your present garment veils the being that you are. And the being that you really are is God. And there is nothing but God. But why we wear it and still our children? Well then, as a child I think as a child. And I reason as a child. And I talk as a child. But when we become men, we give up childish ways. So we can actually think abstractly and not have to take this wonderful pattern and close it in flesh in order to understand it. So when he speaks of the mystery, he said, Christ in you is the mystery of which I speak. That is the hope of glory. I tell you a mystery, he said. And twenty times he uses the word mystery. Now the churches speak of Paul's martyrdom. The Bible, you can cover the Bible from beginning to end and you will not find one word in scripture concerning any martyrdom of Paul. Yet the churches teach that he was martyred, that maybe he was fed to the lions by Nero. Has nothing to do with that. The word martyr and the word witness are one and the same word in scripture. So he is a witness to the truth. But now because the word translated witness is martyr, they say he was a martyr. The word is martyr, but the translation, the meaning of the word is witness. So I come to bear witness to the truth. So when he stands before the judge and declares that his kingdom is not of this world, for this I was born, and for this I have come into the world. For what purpose? To bear witness to the truth. That word translated witness is the same word martyr. I have come to bear witness to the truth. And they claim he was murdered. No. I tell you what I've told you earlier tonight. I have experienced crucifixion as Paul said he did. And it's ecstasy. Sheer ecstasy. Six vortices. Whirling vortices, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, and then the two feet. Vortices. I can tell you the thrill when you are drawn into this body through these six vortices. And then the voice rings out. I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamt a dream. I dreamt, yes. And I exactly what he's dreaming. He's dreaming that he's I. And when he awakes, I am he. The two shall become one. Here was his emanation. Yet his wife, till the sleep of death, his past. And when that sleep of death is over, and he awakes, he awakes in me, as the being in whom he fell asleep. <laughs> and I am he. And because he was a father, when he laid himself down within me, when he wakes, he said, a father, and therefore I am that father, for he became me, and therefore that son that was his son is now my son, and his son is David, and David calls me father. That is the mystery. You dwell upon it. You'll be tempted to go astray and follow after strange gods, but stick to it. I have told you what I know. 
And so if you are tempted, come back to it. As often as you are led astray, come back to it. Try to remember what I've told you. I only have two lectures to give you next week, Monday and Friday. And my plans for the future beyond Friday night are very uncertain. I have no plans really. I have no I do not know really what my future will be. Will I go to Barbados and sit on the beach and watch the flying fish? I don't know. So don't turn away. I plead with you because I'm telling you what's in store for you. Joy beyond measure.